Hello everyone, my name is Blackwatch and welcome to another episode of my Siege lore series. If you like this series and you want to see more, please subscribe. It means a lot to me to see those numbers ticking on up, even though they've slowed down a little bit, because I'm very lazy. And in this episode, we're actually looking at a question that I've pondered in the past, but I've only really now decided to tackle it, because it's going to be relating to another video I'm going to do, which is to do with Harry's possible replacement. Now this one is asking if Harry's recruitment strategy was actually good. Now, whatever you think of Harry's work as Team Rainbow's director, it's an interesting reality for a siege old guard like me to know that the vast majority of players have never actually known another face at the top of the organisation. Since Aurelia Arnott, who was the first six in the game, left, for better or worse, Harry's brought us to today where Rainbow is arguably in its finest form yet. The team under Aurelia was highly skilled and almost a perfect fit for the traditional mould of military and law enforcement personnel that have inhabited the unit in the past. However, Harry's tenure has seen to it that the prowess behind a firearm and in a uniform isn't the only thing that Rainbow should value anymore in its operators. Whilst the vast majority of operators under his leadership still boasted some sort of formal background in armed service, the extent to which this played a part in their backgrounds and their recruitment was scaled back significantly. There was unaffiliated civilians with minimal experience in policing managing to join the unit like Flores, and they made their way into the fold due to the expertise and specialisms that they developed outside of the traditional framework. Whatever way you look at it, Rainbow's benefited from this introduction of the less traditional talent, as it's opened up a way that Rainbow can approach crisis situations. Instead of being a force of last resort, it affords them the opportunity to be a preventative measure, stopping crime and extremism at the source, instead of having to face it when there's no other option left and the damage has ultimately been done. For what it's worth, I think this approach has had its ups and downs, but overall I think it's been a positive thing. I think that there was a period of time where, I know especially disconnecting from the story here, purely focusing on the fans' perspective, there was a bit of a pushback. People weren't too happy to be seeing people that had either not been involved in police or military, or had barely been involved, maybe done some stuff at an academy and then dropped out, being selected ahead of otherwise pretty traditional, pretty classic Rainbow Six characters. And I get it. I understand that perspective, and I probably shared it at the time as well, but when I've taken the time to actually think about it, and think about what it's allowed us to do as players, and Ubisoft to do as storytellers, it really has opened it up to a much more interesting and varied style. As much as I like seeing operators that are more traditionally focused in terms of their gear, Grimm is a really good example of this, you're getting to see a totally different take on the military gear, it's not so much tactical, as it is about sort of jungle warfare, which is a, an aspect of that military background that we don't really get to see in a game like Siege, but we've had it represented here. And then of course you've got your classic ones, the SAS, GIGN, all very faithfully rendered. You don't get too many angles to approach that, and the fact that we've then had people from a less traditional background come in it opens up the visual palette, it opens up the story palette in terms of the backstories that you can give them, the things that they've been involved in, and ultimately the way that they got into the unit in the first place. There are some exceptions. I think there's some that maybe push this angle a little bit too far in certain directions, but ultimately it's all down to a personal thing, and for the one or two people that you don't necessarily approve of or think are a little bit too much of a step in the far-fetched direction for what you would like to see with the game, there will be more than enough in the right direction, whatever that direction is for you, to keep you engaged, to keep you entertained, and to keep you drawn in and related to people. Ultimately, the game is trying to appeal to lots of people. Not every character needs to be the character that you want to see in the game, because there's going to be a lot of other people who want to see that character in the game that they can relate to. and. I don't want to make this a, a sort of wider topic on representation, but but ultimately people being able to get characters in a game that they love, that relate to them, that reflect facets of their personality, their sexuality, their background, whatever it is, that can only be a good thing, and it doesn't detract from other people. You might have your own prejudices, and if you do have those prejudices, I really encourage you 
to take the opportunity to actually look at those views and ask yourself, why do I feel this way? And probably the most important question to ask yourself if you are in that position, and I'm not saying this to condemn people because ultimately a lot of people fall into negative views, but people can come out of those views. The question to ask yourself is, does this really affect my life? And should I really be getting so emotionally held up in something that makes no difference to the way that I live my life? We're all just trying to live our lives the way that we want to and trying to make the best of the situation that we're in. And I think that it's better to just let people do what they want to do and be who they want to be instead of taking the time and the energy to just hate things and hate people for no good reason, really. And I think if you honestly asked yourself those questions and actually sat down and looked at the reasons why you may feel negatively about certain groups of people, you probably find that your views aren't quite as valid as they may feel now. And hopefully if you are one of those people listening to this who's in that position, I really urge you to give yourself that opportunity to move on from the negativity that you've got towards certain people. And to just ultimately respect that we're all trying to live a life and they deserve to live their life the way they want just as much as you deserve to live your life the way you want. So, nice one to wrap it up there. <laughs> Sorry for pushing that into slightly heavier territory, but I kind of feel like it needs to be said. There's a lot of people that sail past these issues. I really think that something like that deserves to be addressed and I feel like it was a tangent that made sense. So, yeah. See you in the next one, everybody. Double batching ya. Yeah.